Hey, good morning, everybody. My name's Chad, uh, one of the pastors here at Pleasant Valley. If you're joining us today, we're thankful for you and excited to hear from Jesus in his word. Um, so I wanna pray. And if you're comfortable in your house uh, where nobody can see you, uh, or maybe your family can see you, but let's just open our hands to the Lord this morning and, and just a posture of saying, God, we wanna hear from you. So pray with me. Lord, uh, here we are, a week whatever of quarantine and waiting, Lord, on you to move, asking questions. God, it's the beginning of Holy Week, and Lord, the whole world is watching and waiting and kind of looking at the same thing to see what will happen with COVID-19. And so, Lord, we want to turn our hearts to you today. I want to ask Jesus that you would speak to us through your word, through your spirit. God, you would move in our homes, and uh, Lord, that we would hear from you. We bless you today, Jesus. Lord, we say that we miss you. Uh, we long for your return, but Lord, we know you're working and you're moving. We ask for the eyes of faith to see it. In Christ's name, amen. So quarantine with Jesus. Uh, we are still in it. And a lot of us are having good days and bad days. I know for me, uh, they kind of, it's pretty consistent that I have one day where I just feel discouraged and over it and ready for this to be done. And then another day where I'm like, well, it's okay. Things are better. And then you've probably experienced some of this too. I know our family time is better. Uh, there's more time to look at each other for sure. And then there are other days when we're like, oh my goodness, everybody get out of here. Um, but good days and bad days, uh, difficult things. One of the things I was thinking about before I stepped up here was right now, uh, on the internet worldwide, um, and over the last several hours, 24 hours of people doing church, probably the more of the gospel and of the Lord and scripture and worship on the internet than at any other time in history, all at the same time, live happening, people reaching out and asking, Lord, what are you doing? Last week, we considered this worldwide pandemic and began to ask questions. And if you were here with us, we talked about God actually reaching his hand out and slowing the earth down and asking us to look to him, to ask deep questions. And so here's a question for you today. Now, even this past week, as you've thought about that, you thought about what he's doing, can you see him? Can you see Jesus? Can you see him at work? And your response may be like, well, yeah, I mean, I've already seen him. I already know who he is. I can see him fine. I know what he did. You know, I know about Christmas. I know about Easter. I know that Jesus is good. I know that Jesus is love. Sure, I see him. But what about seeing him in the midst of suffering, in the midst of crisis, pandemic, COVID-19? This week, uh, there was a poll done by a group called the Joshua Fund. There's an author named Joel Rosenberg, and they asked 1,000 people, both believers in Jesus and non-believers, this was the question. Do you see the COVID-19 pandemic as a wake-up call from God or as a possible sign of coming judgment? So not just Christians, non-Christians and Christians, and 44%, almost half said yes. Now, I don't know about the last one, the coming judgment part, because that's not really in our field, but as a wake-up call, just if I'm looking at it personally, sure, yeah. I see God speaking. I think people are starting to wake up. Take a look at this picture of some nurses on the rooftop of Vanderbilt University. Now they're nurses. They're trained to help patients, but what are they doing? They're praying. <laughs> they're praying for the Lord to help them, to, to heal their patients, to give assistance to the doctors. Why are they doing that? Because they are getting it they're starting to realize, you know what? This is what's happening. This is what God is maybe saying. Maybe he's trying to speak to us. And that's one thing to say God's working in the world. He's, he's doing things. He's sovereign. He's God, right? He's got to be, if Hebrews tells us, he upholds everything by the word of his power. And we always say this at Pleasant Valley, but that breath you just took, you didn't take it just because God designed you well and wound you up and said, here, go. His word actually says that he sustains us. Every heartbeat that happens in you is because he is sovereignly in control. And so it's one thing to say that he's acting in a general big way in the affairs of human history. It's another thing to say it's personal. 
It's direct. So last week it was, I wonder, is God moving? Is he slowing us all down? This week, I want you to think about, what about me? What does God want to say to me? Move beyond the general big things to truly understand how he might be at work, what he might be saying, especially when we think we already know what he's doing, when we already understand. So today I want to introduce you to a group of people uh, in the scripture who thought they knew all about Jesus. They're like, oh yeah, we got this guy. We've got him pinned. We know what he's about. And so they decide, hey, we're going to have him over for dinner. This guy's named Simon, his friends. They said, let's have Jesus over for dinner because we think we have him figured out. We think we know what he's about. So they're quarantined for a moment in a room with Jesus. And that's what I want us to do today. They have plans for Jesus. He has other plans. We're gonna look at Luke chapter seven today. If you have a Bible at home, grab it. If not, um, you can just read along the screen. Uh, Luke chapter seven, verse 36. Let's read together. One of the Pharisees, and this is uh, Simon, asked him to, hey, come to dinner, Jesus. He asked him to eat with him. So he goes into this Pharisee's house. He sits down at the table, reclines at table because that's what they did back then. They, they were laying down on their side. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that Jesus was there reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment, perfume, very expensive, standing behind him at the dinner party, at his feet, she starts crying and she begins to wet his feet with her tears, awkward, and wipes them with her hair and starts kissing his feet and pouring this perfume over his feet at this dinner party. So the Pharisee looks and says, if this man is truly a prophet, he would know who this woman is, what sort of woman this is who's touching him and she's a sinner. So Simon knew Jesus' name. He knew that he was a great teacher. He'd been watching him. He wanted to hang out with him, thought he had him figured out, knew there was something even extraordinary about him, probably heard some about the miracles, but he wasn't sure yet who he was. So he invites him to his own house. This is his turf. He can control the conversation. He has some questions. He has some things that he wants Jesus to answer for. It's his house, his rules, his questions. At least he thinks so. We understand this, right? We understand how to keep things under control. I'll go to church when I want to go to church. I'll talk about spiritual things when I want to talk about spiritual things. Don't be pushy. Don't be preachy with me. I'll get serious when I want to get serious. But God kind of has other things planned, doesn't he? He decides to interrupt. We were in control pre-COVID-19, weren't we? We're not now. We're not now. Our plans were, I'll talk about you, Jesus. I'll think about these things when I want to. Jesus, I think is saying, no, you'll think about them now. You'll think about them now. I know how to handle Jesus. Jesus is for Sundays. Jesus is for Easter, next week, Christmas. Jesus is to be kept in my religious box. Nice, neat, tidy, safe. This is exactly how Simon is trying to handle the rabbi Jesus at arm's length, pushing him away. And we do the same thing, don't we? There's a problem with this though. If we keep Jesus at a safe distance, if we social distance from Jesus, he can be sitting right in front of us and we will not see him. God is sitting at your table right now in this quarantine, but it's possible you can't see him. So where is Jesus at work in this mess? He's sitting with you. I promise you, he's sitting with you. But we can be blind. We can be deaf. And so he allows things to happen. He allows disturbances. For Simon, guess what it was? Nice dinner party, gonna have some great theological discussion. What happens? This woman comes busting in, starts crying. She is disrupting his party. I love the thought of this. This woman says, when she learned that Jesus was having dinner with the Pharisees, this tells you something about her because if she's a, what they're trying to say with a woman of the city, she was a prostitute. 
She knew her own heart was just so far gone. But she waits until he's actually with the people that hate her the most. Why not wait till Jesus comes out of his house? You know, kind of a Nicodemus moment in a back alley in a street. Like, hey, can I ask you something, Jesus? I've heard some things. I was just wondering. No, she busts in when she learns that he's actually with these religious experts. It says a lot about what's going on in her heart. It says a lot about this moment. Why is she doing it at this moment? Why this house? Why with these people? Why April of 2020, Jesus, for COVID-19? Why here in my town with my family do we have cases and people that we know might be sick? Why in my state? Why in our country? Why in the world? Why now? I think for her, she would say, and these are people that you can talk to someday in heaven. You can ask them, hey, what was it about that moment? I think she would say, I just saw, I could see for the first time. I was understanding for the first time. In other words, in her moment of quarantine, she could see him sitting across the table. Simon and his friends though, what are they doing? scoffing, probably gasping. The more she does her thing, the more she cries, the more she puts the perfume in the air. They're like, Ugh, upset, gasping. How could she, you know, just kind of saying all this stuff. They're missing the most important person in the room, which is Jesus. They can't see him. Now, Simon is a religious professional. And so he doesn't say that out loud. He says, if this person were really a prophet, he would say this. Can I tell you what he was saying on the inside? This, get out of here, you filth. You are a virus. Get out of my house. We are upright, moral, religious people here. We don't need your kind sinners in our house. And because of this, he cannot see God sitting in front of him. The result, kind of like our result right now, chaos. No more life as normal anymore. Life as normal is dinner parties, let's talk. Let's keep God where we want him. Let's keep him in a box. I'll talk about Jesus when I want. I'll go to church when I want. Nobody forces me. And then God says, now I'm gonna force you. I'm gonna put you in a timeout. There is no normal anymore. Her hair is down. She's crying. She has busted this perfume, which is a prostitute. She would have worn it around her neck. Everyone would have known what that meant, who she was. She breaks it, very expensive, and says a lot with her actions. So what is Jesus gonna do? How will he respond? Look at verse 40. Jesus answering Simon, who just said this really nice question, said this, Simon, I have something to say to you. And so Simon answers back, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, which is probably about $50,000. And the other only 50 denarii. When they couldn't pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt and he said to him, you've judged rightly. Simon, I have something to say to you. I think that phrase right there, you could just go ahead and put a line through Simon's name and say, Chad, April, 2020, I have something to say to you. Put your name in there. Pleasant Valley, Winona, the state of Minnesota, the state of Wisconsin, Iowa, Tennessee, California, Africa, France, Great Britain, Taiwan, China. I have something to say to you. I think we should have the grace to say back to him, say it, teacher. Say whatever you need to say. So he tells this story about two people who both need forgiveness. What's interesting though is he talks about love with the person that they owed, which gives you a real clue to God's heart for you and him. It's not just so that you can be clean and he can be like, okay, you're fine. Now I won't judge you for eternity. It's 
so that you can love him. Which one will love him more for the forgiveness? There's two types of people, just two. Those who know their need for Jesus and those who don't. That's it. There are no more categories. Those who know their need for Jesus and those who don't. Like we talked about last week, on the surface, this is a dinner party that's been interrupted by a prostitute. Underneath, Jesus is teaching. He's saying something to them and he's saying something to us. Simon and his friends need Jesus just as much as she does. They just don't know it yet. Jesus would say to Simon, his friends, and to us, I have something to say to you. Say it, Jesus. You are unaware of the virus that's already killing you. You're unaware of the virus that's already killing you. You, you may balk at that and you may be like, hey, don't make this so spiritual. Don't make this all churchy. This is just a worldwide crisis and struggle. We just need to focus on that, focus on loving people. Don't make this all you know, crazy like that. Here's the problem. The Bible, and I believe this with all my heart, always is doing this. In history, God's heart is for you to know him. And so the course of your life, the events that you walk into, all of them are designed and orchestrated and overseen so that you will know him. And if you don't pay attention, guess what he does? Turns up the volume, confines you, puts you in a timeout so you will listen. COVID-19 isn't the deepest problem. It is a huge problem, but the virus that's killing us is our own sin, our own separation from Jesus. You know, it's interesting that nothing, let's just think about this. Ultimately, nothing can protect you perfectly from COVID-19. We've seen that. Like even with the greatest measures, washing your hands a hundred times a day, staying in your house, no matter what, you could still get it. People have. They didn't even know they got it. They didn't know where, what they touched, what person they were around, what microscopic droplet somehow made it into their body and started to work destruction. No amount of money, no work of art, no higher level of education, no knowledge you have, no measure of social status or distance, nothing can truly keep you from getting this virus apart from supernatural act of the Lord. I think this is why most of us, and I'll just say, I, I had to get there. I was one of those right at the beginning being like, whatever, this is a big sham. And I tell you what, like I'm so, <laughs> I'm so over people online still trying to do that. Why? Because now I, I know I'm connected to people, pastors that I know whose families are suffering from these things. And I think most of us are getting there. I watched this clip last week of this ER doctor, Dr. Scott Samlin in Chicago. There's a picture of him. He was being interviewed. He was actually on a shift. He was exhausted. He has a wife and a daughter, but he hasn't seen them in a couple of weeks because he's living at the hospital. He doesn't want to infect them. He's afraid. 70% of the people they're seeing are COVID-19 issues. <clears throat> And here's what he said. He said, you know, I deal with gunshots every day. He said, this is the only thing, this being COVID-19 that scares me. While he's talking and you could see him being interviewed and all of a sudden he looks over his shoulder and somebody's coming in and there's a patient. And so the interviewer from CBS said, hey, what are you, what's going on? He said, oh, somebody's coding. Somebody's heart had stopped who had just come in and tested positive. And he said, well, what are they doing? He said, they're doing CPR. They talked for a few more minutes. He looked over his shoulder again, then he looked back and the interviewer said, hey, what just happened? He said, he died. And then he just kept going. And I, I was just so struck. One, because, and I've heard this from people who are nurses and doctors and those who work in these situations is that it happens so often that they've had to learn to turn something off. But even then, some of them, and you could see it in his face, Dr. Scott Samlin was exhausted and overwhelmed. And yet we still have people saying, I can't get this virus. I'm strong. I bet I'll be safe. I'll continue on as normal. I'm not sick. I feel fine. Everyone's overreacting until it's your daughter. And I saw this, a pastor last night, he's been asking for prayer. 
His oldest daughter, no pre-existing conditions, is intubated right now in the hospital. And they can't be with her. She's unconscious. Can't talk to her. Praying, Lord, just help. What happens right now when any of us have a sniffle or a cough? And you know you've done this at home. Maybe it's just an allergy or something happens, but you cough and you're maybe in the kitchen by yourself and you go, "Uh oh, and you're praying, I hope this is nothing. The littlest thing. Here's though what I think Jesus would push Simon and his friends and I think us to see, telling us this story about the debtors who were forgiven. What if your heart is sick? I mean, your spiritual heart and you don't know it. That's what's happening with Simon. That's what's really going on here for Jesus. Simon has a spiritual sickness he's unaware of. Though he is a religious expert, he should know, but he doesn't. The good news is this though, clarity can be found. You can see it is possible to gain understanding, wisdom, insight, revelation. And guess where Simon can get it? From the God who's sitting across the table. The woman already knows this, which is why when you're watching her act, she's seeing, she's understanding. So what happens when her understanding and her eyes of faith meet Jesus' mercy, grace, and goodness? The last few verses, look at this. Turning to the woman, he said, Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She has wet my feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, a greeting, but from the time I came in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil. She's not ceased to, uh, she's anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you her sins, which are many are forgiven for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. He said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, and they're griping and grumbling, who is this who even forgives sins? He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see? Do you really understand? Do you see me? Do you see me the way she sees me? What's interesting is Jesus has been denied basic hospitality. Back then, you know, we go to somebody's house and not now, but when we go to somebody's house, usually it's like, hey, shake hands, maybe a quick uh, pat on the back, a side hug if you're a guy, whatever. And, you know, let me take your coat. Back then, when you came into someone's house, it was, let me give you some water for your feet to wash. And then it was the customary kiss on the cheek. They didn't do that for Jesus, which is saying something. He doesn't flip out, doesn't go crazy. Why? Because he's committed to them seeing. He wants them to see. And so he says, do you see her, Simon? I think Simon was like, yes, I see her. She wasn't invited. I didn't ask her to come here. She's messing up my agenda, our little dinner party, our very important Q&A time, because you have some answering to do, Jesus. I wanna know what's going on here, why you're making such a disturbance in our town. We really need you to answer some things. You said that in the past week to the Lord, to God, why are you doing this? I really need you to answer. Simon continues, I see her for the distraction that she is. I see her for the sinner she is. Why don't you? She's the problem with the world. She is the virus. What's amazing about Jesus is he uses disruption and distraction. So the woman come busting into the house to mess up the normal, to ask Simon a question about his own heart. Jesus uses disruption and distraction of COVID-19 to ask us questions about our hearts, our souls. In asking Simon, do you see this woman? Jesus is really asking Simon, Do you see the condition of your own heart? Do you understand what's happening in there? The virus that is eating you alive? And further, do you not see that I'm the remedy? Jesus asking, do you see that I am seated at your table? He doesn't, he doesn't. So let's make it personal. Chad, do you see? Put your name there. 
Do I see what's going on? Do we see what's going on? That's the deeper question that will bother Simon and hopefully bothers us right now. Long after Jesus has left the room, after this quarantine is over, after the woman is out of his perfectly organized life, after this virus is history, will we still be asking the questions if we can see him? If we know what he's doing, what does it look like to truly see him? Because things will absolutely not return to normal when you finally see him. I love this picture, this guy with a mask on and a Bible. And I think it's, it's a great picture for now because what it's saying is I'm in this moment. I know I have to cover my face. I know that there's a virus. I know that there's stuff going on. But also I think I'm gonna start asking these questions in the right direction and not necessarily from the government or the CDC. I'll follow those directions, but God, what are you doing? What are you up to? Do we see what he's doing? You know, the way she acts makes me really uncomfortable. I remember this whole story, every time I've heard it my whole life, I'm just like, Ugh, just imagining what's happening, breaking up this party. But for her, she's leaving her former lifestyle. That act of breaking that perfume means I'm not gonna use this for what I've been doing up until this point. There's no mistaking what she thinks of Jesus. She's pouring out her everything to him. Though she's been abused and abused, feels tremendous weight of her sin. She sees an answer. He's right across the table. The virus that's been in her of sin, sickness, and death, she sees the answer right in front of her. And what's the result? Just like last week, what does Jesus say? What's the most important thing he can say to us? I love you and you're forgiven. That's what we need. You know, there've been so many moments coming from quarantine homes of the Lord doing great and amazing things. And this past week, I watched one of this sweet little girl in Georgia who her mom had just shown her a clip of these, this church outside a hospital. They were singing Waymaker. They were praying over the patients, praying for the doctors. There's been other videos like that of the doctors on the roof and the nurses singing along. Just this beautiful declaration of worship. She's really upset about what's happening. And so her mom decided to turn on the camera and this little girl sitting there, she's eating ice cream, which I think is great because that this is life. She's eating ice cream and she talks about Jesus and what he thought of those people worshiping and what she thinks Jesus is doing in this season. I want you to watch and listen. Hey mama, you know when um, the people at the church, not the church, but at the hospital were singing, I bet you that, that Jesus, like his heart was bursting. Oh, I'm sure. And the devil has no control anymore. You no are control. Here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Working oh. in the midst. And the devil has no idea what Jesus is doing. Oh, I pray that God has this all like planned out and he knows exactly what he's doing. She said to her mom, I bet you Jesus heart and I love it because it's where I'm from down south was bursting when he heard them singing. And even just the interaction with her mom of, I pray that he has this, he does. Mom, he does. Psalm two, I think it is, um, Psalm eight. says, out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have established strength. Another version says you've ordained praise. She speaks, I think prophetically, the devil has no idea what he's doing. He has no control. He has no control. And then this just beautiful moment, she turns back and she's listening to that worship in the background and she turns back and she says, he's a way maker. 
just stirs my heart thinking about her response. You know what? She sees. Just like the woman, she sees, she gets it. She understands what this is all about. For Simon, the planned dinner party, keeping Jesus where we can control him, pretending that we're immune to our spiritual condition, normal life, life pre-virus, pre-COVID. Jesus in his mercy and grace though says, yeah, we're gonna break into that party. (laughs) We're gonna let that party be disrupted because this is about relationship with me. This is about your heart being healed trusting him. The bigger question at play right now is, do we love him a little or with everything? The latter is the one you want. The latter is the one that sees and understands he's all you have. You know, this, this day is historically Palm Sunday. It's, it's the day there were lots of people waving branches and saying, Hosanna, oh, save us, King. Jesus riding into town, You know, a lot of those people only a few days later would be the same ones yelling, crucify him because they weren't really seeing. Even Jesus sat around the table with his disciples for the Passover and knowing that every single one of them would say, we're out of here. We didn't sign up for this. He was undeterred. He stayed with them. If uh, you need to go grab something, if you didn't do it yet for communion, we're gonna take communion today. Um, Real simple, even if you just grab some bread and if you don't have juice, get some water. Um, But there's a verse in Isaiah 53 and I'll just read a couple of these if you still need to go and, and find some, but we're gonna partake together. I love this from Isaiah 53. Here's what it says. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs. And another translation says, our infirmities, our sicknesses, and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, if we're willing, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So Jesus sat at that table with those guys who not all of them really understood or knew what was going on with him. They would all desert him. And it says, as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, he broke it. And then he said, take and eat. This is my body. So let's partake together. He also took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. So let's partake together. and pray for us. Lord, we love you. Lord, we don't understand everything that's happening, but I pray God, even as we've just been in this thing now for a few weeks, that our our eyes are beginning to open, our hearts are beginning to soften. Lord, that we've moved from just, maybe God is doing something to I'm sure of it, to now I personally know that he wants to do something in my life. Lord, I trust you, we trust you. We thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us on the cross. God, we pray now as we just spend a couple more songs together in worship uh, that you would minister to our hearts. I thank you for your death. Thank you for paying for our sins, Lord, for providing a remedy for our sickness, Lord. 
the sin that will take all of us. It will have no mercy on anyone. God, thank you that you rose from the dead. You conquered death. Jesus, you ascended into heaven. And Lord, we await your return. And we know that you are at work right now in our world. We pray for the grace and the strength to respond to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.